Good afternoon. On behalf of DVC's Student Equity Work Group, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first event of the Fall 22 Equity Speaker Series. My name is Rosa Armendariz. I'm the Dean for Student Equity and Engagement, and my pronouns are she, her, ella. I also serve as the co-chair of the Student Equity Work Group with Dr. Sangha Niyogi, who you'll hear from soon. And we're honored this year to kick off our series today. Each year, the Student Equity Work Group chooses a theme for our speaker series. In the past, we've had themes such as undoing injustice, rise by lifting indigeneity, decolonize our world, thinking with indigenous studies, and cultivating critical hope. This year's theme is health justice, reimagining health and wellness. Health justice means so much more than just having access to quality health care. It is also about organizing from the ground up and analyzing the systems, policies, practices, institutions that impact our community's health and well being. Today, we kick off our series with a conversation about reproductive health justice and so much more related to that. As part of the healing and empowerment of our community, I also want to acknowledge that Diablo Valley College is situated on the ancestral lands of the Bay Miwok people. We name the history of this beloved place as a gesture of respect and reparation towards the indigenous residents of the colonized land we now call home. We acknowledge the profound suffering caused by the theft and colonization of this land and grieve the ongoing systematic harm to Miwok culture, as well as to all the indigenous cultures of what we now call North America. We honor the Bay Miwok as the ancestral stewards of this land and are actively working to build the right relationship. Before handing over the program, I want to remind all of you at um, at the end of the program, if you can fill out the survey that we'll put out on a slide, we do want your feedback on the event so that we can continue to uh, improve and also to offer events that you are interested in. And I will now hand it over to my colleague, Sangha Niyogi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Sangha Niyogi. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I teach sociology and social justice, and I co-direct the Student Equity Work Group with Dean Rosa Armendariz. Access to reproductive rights is one of the most hotly contested topics globally, and the debate is clouded by misinformation about the true ramifications of restricting access to this basic healthcare service. So I am eager to welcome an expert on this topic to DVC. Dr. Anu Manchikanti Gomez is an associate professor of social welfare at the University of California, Berkeley. For more than 20 years, Dr. Gomez has worked as a health equity researcher with a focus on reproduction and sexuality throughout the life course. As a researcher, she is deeply committed to centering the perspectives, needs, and lived experiences of communities and works in close partnership with local and national organizations to generate knowledge about reproductive self-determination. Dr. Gomez's current research focuses on evaluation of an anti-racist guaranteed income program for Black and Pacific Islander pregnant people in San Francisco and development of person-centered metrics of contraceptive access. So without further ado, a warm DVC welcome to Dr. Anu Gomez. You're muted, Dr. Gomez. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> didn't get all of the, the things together. Um, thank you so much for that warm 
welcome. I'm glad to be here in community with all of you today. And especially after I uh, was sick a couple of weeks ago, I'm really glad uh, to have the chance to go ahead and do this presentation. Um, I, uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm actually coming from you from the land of the Ohlone, um, although I'm only in Berkeley, not too far away, um, which is you know important to think about how many peoples um, were here long before us. Um, so today I am going to be talking about pregnancy criminalization in a post-Roe America. Um, first, I am going to just share a bit about who I am um, to orient everyone. And then I'm going to actually do a very, well, it's not that brief. I tried to make it as brief as possible, but a little bit of an abortion 101, um, you know, introduction because I, because as Sangha said, there's so much misinformation out there. I really want to uh, make sure that you have the information that's necessary to understand the next um, point about pregnancy criminalization. And then I'm going to talk about some ways to get involved. Um, I will say I am actually, um, I mean, I'm probably more of an expert on abortion than most people, but it is not currently a focus of my research, even though I do care deeply about it and have worked on it in this area for a long time. Um, so I also come to you with some humility. If I, if you have a question I don't know the answer to, I'm gonna tell you, I don't know because I do not want to be um, spreading further misinformation since there is so much on this issue. So hi, um, so as Sangha said, I am a new Manchapani Gomez. I'm a researcher, a professor, a mentor, a mom, a partner, a friend, a daughter, a sister, and a community member. And I think it's really important to acknowledge all of our identities and complexities um, because those do show up in our work, especially as, um, as a researcher, as someone who is creating and producing knowledge. Um, I always say I'm a Southerner squared. I grew up in Kentucky. Um, my part of Kentucky considers itself to be the South. Not all of Kentucky does, but mine does. And then my uh, parents are immigrants from South India. Um, and so I have, have a deep Southern heritage from multiple countries. And um, very much in, important to my work is my, is my heritage and my family and my ancestry. Uh, these are two important um, women from my family. On the left is my great grandmother um, and she was uh, widowed at a very young age and shut out from her family and um, ended up adopting my grandfather and became a very important figure in my father's life, supporting him in his education and eventually um, immigration here to the US. And um, on the right is my grandmother, um, my mother's mother, who um, both both parents came from large families, but you know, I grew up knowing, knowing that my mom had um, you know, seven siblings, there were eight of them, but, you know, pretty early also learned that my grandmother had given birth 16 times and that half of those um, babies didn't survive to uh, past the age of five. And so that, um, so these stories are very important because they're the fabric of who I am, but they also just really brought um, the issues around gender equity and reproduction into my view very early in life. And so I honor my ancestors in my work um, and then there's me uh, in Kentucky. This is a picture from my yearbook, but I grew up, um, you know, it's a very Southern Baptist area and I had no sex education growing up. I think that I was supposed to get abstinence education, but I didn't get it. We didn't get anything. And so that is something I've thought about a lot is, you know, in becoming a reproductive health researcher um, and what it's meant, you know, from in my own personal life, but what it means for people to not have access to high quality, unbiased information and how they move through the world in this important aspect of humanity. Um, so I will move on to the to the formal uh, part of my talk. Um, so I wanted to talk about some basics uh, around abortion, just providing a note on language before I get started. Um, not all people who have the capacity for pregnancy identify as women and um, so I really try to use the language of pregnant people. Um, I think it's also important to note that efforts to curtail reproductive freedom are rooted in misogyny as well as other things, um, racism for sure. Um, but but that you know they they are anti women in terms of the ways they are trying to restrict the rights of a certain group. However, um, 
that can also be very harmful because it excludes uh, people, trans and non-binary people who are able to become pregnant. And so I personally try to use this language of pregnant people um, to be inclusive and just wanna know that sometimes my slides refer to women because that's who the data were collected from or that's who researchers assumed the data were collected from. And by women, they mean cisgender women. Um, so I think this is something our field is working on to try to improve, but, um, but you know, just a note on if there's sometimes a disconnect between what I'm saying and what's on the slide. So first, um, I just wanted to start with some definitions. Um, typically, when we talk about abortion, we're talking about induced abortion, which means ending a pregnancy with medication or a medical procedure. But um, interestingly, in medicine and even in the billing codes um, for medicine, um, you know, there's also something called a spontaneous abortion, and that's a pregnancy loss before the 20th week of pregnancy, which we usually, you know, in popular culture, we call that a miscarriage. Um, and I just wanted to point this out because it does actually have um, some implications because a lot of the sort of medications and procedures that are used for induced abortion are also used as treatments for miscarriage. And in this current landscape, that actually really matters um, because it's uh, reducing the high quality care for procedures beyond abortion because, because of um, the way things have been set up in our society. So, um, you know, abortion has been around forever. Um, this is, you know, an example from the 1700s when uh, Benjamin Franklin gave instructions on at-home abortions in a book that he published. Uh, but, you know, abortion was around long before that and long before a white man wrote about it. Um, but it is, you know, something that has been, you know, part of societies and human life um, for forever. Um, in the US, one in four women will have an abortion by age 45 and abortion is extremely safe. It has a uh, rate of complications um, lower than removal of wisdom teeth. And the best evidence suggests there are no long-term negative effects on mental or physical health. Um, I have a I have a link with all my um, some sources uh, since we're talking about evidence here. I want to make sure that people have resources. So I'm not sure if someone from DBC can share that, or I can share it at the end if needed, um, including a link to this report on the safety and quality of abortion care in the U.S. So there are multiple types of abortion, but I wanted to spend a, a few minutes talking about medication abortion. Um, this is a type of abortion that involves two steps with two medications. Um, the first is called mifepristone, which is a drug that blocks progesterone, a, or a hormone that is required to continue a pregnancy. And the second medication is called misoprostol, um, which softens the cervix. And so Medication abortion is approved in the US to end a pregnancy through 70 days gestation, and that means the age of the pregnancy, um, which, you know, if you didn't know, day one starts um, on, the, on the first day of, of one's last menstrual period. Um, so this is, you know, about, this is good, this is available through about the 10th week of pregnancy, but that, you know, you have to recognize that people often don't find out they're pregnant until they've missed a period. So they may be five or six weeks pregnant before they even know that they're pregnant. Um, so the official reg regimen for medication abortion is receiving the first drug, MIFI, is the abbreviation, from a provider on day one. Um, you know, until recently you had to get it in person um, or maybe through telehealth. Uh, now um, the FDA is allowing um, the medications to be mailed. So something that happened during COVID, um, which is, you know, something that can greatly increase access. Um, and then you take the second uh, drug, miso, at home 24 to 48 hours later. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, there's, there tends to be a lot of cramping and essentially the pregnancy passes, um, you know, at home or wherever someone, someone chooses to be um, after they take the second medication. So this is a sort of the clinical uh, way to do this type of abortion. But something that ha has happened recently is that um, more people are using this approach to do something called a self-managed abortion. And so, um, so the difference is, is that folks are self-sourcing the medications. They're ordering them. Um, you could, there's, there's a couple websites that you can order them from or you can obtain them, um, for example, in a pharmacy in Mexico. Sometimes people who live closer to the border will go to Mexico to get the medications. And so they 
<clears throat> manage taking them without the supervision of a healthcare provider, but it's the same thing. You know, they take it the first medication on day one, and then the second 24 to 48 hours later. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna take a sip of water. Um, and there's also interest in, uh, in advancing a regimen where people use just the second drug, mesoprostol. There's some evidence that it's pretty effective, almost as effective as the combination. And there are a lot less restrictions on the second drug. So that's something that people have been talking about recently. Um, there are some other types of abortion and really <clears throat> it depends like sort of the context of the pregnancy and also um, the time point. But there's vacuum aspiration, um, which is usually offered to the 13th week of pregnancy, um, dilation and evacuation that's used after the 12th week of pregnancy. So this is a time, you know, by that time, medication or abortion is not available in the US. Um, and then there's induced abortion. It involves taking medications to cause the uterus to contract and pass the tissue. And this is used mostly after the 16th week of pregnancy. And you may have seen um, recently that Chrissy Teigen, um, you know, about a year and a half ago, she um, and her husband, John Legend, uh, suffered a, a very sad pregnancy loss, and she was very public about it, um, which I think is shows incredible vulnerability and also is does a lot um, to help reduce stigma around these topics, being able to talk about them. Um, and But just recently, um, you know, she came out and said, you know, that she actually realized what she had was an induction abortion um, because her you know, her um, pregnancy was not viable. Um, and, you know, so, th so they, they had to um, essentially induce, you know, induce the delivery early um, in order to end it. Um, but she said that she, she just didn't realize that what she had was not a miscarriage until, um, until, you know, reproductive justice and restrictions on abortion access really sort of became very, um, very much an awareness in the public came around last year once the cases went to the Supreme Court. Um, and then just one final point here. Um, sometimes some people, particularly pol politicians, talk about some contraceptive methods, some birth control methods as abortifacients. And what they mean by that is a substance that causes an abortion. Um, and so there are sometimes discussions of a couple birth control methods, particularly the copper interuterine device, IUD, um, and emergency contraception, plan B, the morning after pill, um, being targeted for restrictions because some perceive them to be abortifacient. And this is about like the mechanism by which they work. Um, in the met, you know, it's clear in the medical establishment that they are not. However, um, you know, it is possible that these methods could face uh, more restrictions in the future if there was some designation of them as a board of exit, but there is not at this point, um, but that's something that could happen that, you know, that's something that people are are cautious about in the future. Um, I, I'm doubtful that that would happen, but it is part of the discussion. So I want to also then give you a little bit of background on the U.S. Um, policy landscape to sort of, you know, talk about how we got to where we are today. Um, and this is where we are today as of June, um, Roe versus Wade was overturned, which ended the federal um, constitutional right to abortion. But before that, um, you know, abortion was, was, was illegal in the US. And so, um, like I said, you know, Benjamin Franklin in the 1700s was, was you know, providing information on how people could um, induce abortions. But by 1880, all states in the US had laws restricting abortion. And then by 1910, abortion was illegal at every stage in pregnancy in every state. And it remained that way until Roe versus Wade, which in 1973 conferred a national constitutional right to abortion. And I remember when a lawyer colleague um, came to talk to one of my classes at Berkeley um, three or four years ago, and she was talking about the constitutional right to abortion. And um, the students were like, what do you mean a constitutional right to abortion? It doesn't say that anything about abortion in the constitution. But what that means is that, you know, the Supreme Court determined that the 14th amendment, which is about the right to privacy, 
um, included the right to abortion. And that was, you know, set by precedent earlier in the Griswold versus Connecticut case, which made birth control legal. Um, and so that was also a case that was decided about a constitutional right, to, you know, to something based on the right to privacy. But uh, very quickly, you know, essentially, as soon as, you know, Roe versus Wade was passed, there was, you know, many efforts to undermine it, overturn it, et cetera. The first major blow was in 1976, the Hyde Amendment was implemented for the first time. Um, and so this amendment is a federal budget writer and it disallows the use of federal dollars for abortion. And so what that means is um, if, you know, states are not allowed to use their federal dollars from from their Medicaid dollars um, to provide abortion care. And so in California, Medi-Cal does cover abortion, but that's because um, our state uses our state dollars to pay for that care. So in other states, um, particularly, you know, states where abortion is not even available anymore, but even, even before that, you know, states did not want to use their dollars for abortion care. So that meant that people who had Medicaid, who are low income and predominantly people of color, um, did not have the ability to use their insurance. And so this is sort of a fundamentally, um, you know, it's a, it's, a matter, it's a matter of economic and racial justice because it was something that was targeted particularly to low income, income people and people of color. Um, and then in 1992, there was another famous case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And so in this case, the Supreme Court reaffirmed the right to abortion as had been conferred by Roe, but introduced this framework of an undue burden. And what it means is that it allowed states to put in place restrictions to abortion as long as they did not place a substantial obstacle in the path of a patient seeking an abortion. That's incredibly subjective. You know, what is a substantial obstacle and how do you determine that, of course. Um, but really, I think this, this comic sort of illustrates it well. Um, you know, it's got the people saying, yes, you have the right to an abortion, but the state can make you jump through a few hoops first. And so some examples of hoops are a 24 hour waiting period, spousal notice, um, providers have to pr provide false information about the impacts of abortion on mental health or breast cancer, um, parental involvement, right? Parents have to be involved for minors. Those are all, you know, hoops, obstacles um, that are allowed as long as the court didn't determine determined that it placed an undue burden on people obtaining abortions. But then in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization case last year, um, uh, which concerned a Mississippi state law that banned most abortions after the 15th week of pregnancy, um, five justices joined an opinion overturning Roe and Casey, which revoked the constitutional right to abortion and returning the regulation of abortion, abortion access to individual states. Um, and this is a 6-3 ruling, and the difference is here, um, actually, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts didn't, he didn't join the opinion that overturned, the part of the opinion overturning Roe and Casey, and so that's why there's a little difference between my slide and the New York Times headline. So what's happened? That was June 24th. What's happened since then? So this is, um, the Guttmacher Institute is a very good source of data on abortion and policy, they track policies. And so um, here we have a before and after essentially. So on the left, you see policies in effect as of June 9th, uh, which was before the ruling had happened, but the, 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 the draft of the ruling was leaked um, as many of you all probably know. And you can see on the left, it's, the map is a lot more yellow um, than it is as of Wednesday, where you see the map um, is, is predominantly maroon. Um, and so that means that in just, you know, not even, how many months has this been? Not even four months. We've had a dramatic shift in abortion access in the US um, with states moving from some restrictions to restrictive to most restrictive. What does that mean? So here's a little bit of detail on how they're classifying the different states. And so most restrictive um, is, you know, the maroon state bans abortion completely. And so what you can see is that most of the, South, um, a lot of the South is maroon. And then what's not maroon is um, is orange or the, the mid orange, very restrictive or restrictive. Um, and then you can see sort of a handful of states that are in the protective California cal, uh, category 
as California and then Oregon is the most protective. Um, so that means, you know, whereas um, before, you know, someone in Mississippi could have maybe go to Georgia, they could still go to Georgia, but they may have difficulty, um, you know, accessing abortion there because of the multiple restrictions and the, and the early gestational age ban. And so for many people, the closest abortion clinic may now be in Southern Illinois, which is actually interestingly just about an hour from where I grew up in Kentucky, but there are two clinics that have opened there in Southern Illinois um, or, or will be opening because Illinois is a, is a state that is, um, you know, has protective policies and also like California is um, welcoming people from other states to access care um, because they can't in their own states. And so, um, so this is a pretty dramatic shift and I think it still can get worse. I also think it can still can get better. Um, I think, uh, you know, mo the Oregon is the most protective state because they don't have any limit on uh, gestational age at which time you can um, obtain a pregnancy. That was the only difference I could see from the, their ratings um, on their website. So I'm not sure if there's anything else, but California is, is doing good. And I'm gonna talk about at the end of this talk, some of the things that are happening here. So in addition to just the sort of gutting of access in many states, there have been a host of unexpected spillover effects. And I have unexpected in quotes because I think these are unexpected to the public, but I think they're not at all surprising to people in the field because many people have been talking about what's going to happen if you um, if, if if Roe goes away for a long time. So um, as I was mentioning earlier, um, you know some of the procedures and medications that are used in induced abortion are also used in the treatment of ectopic pregnancy and to manage miscarriages. And so, for example, if someone has an incomplete miscarriage at home, they may go to the hospital and have to have a, um, a DNA procedure to have the rest, you know, of the rest of the tissues removed. And so pretty immediately after the decision came down, um, you know, there were reports on Twitter of people not being able to access miscarriage care um, or treatment of ectopic pregnancy. So because, um, and often, you know, so much in medicine is about liability. And I think there was, you know, very strict individual, you know, sort of individual hospitals or systems interpreting uh, the legal restrictions to say that they couldn't provide this care. Um, mesoprostol, which is the second drug in the medication abortion regimen, um, is used for other purposes beyond abortion. It's actually approved as a treatment for stomach ulcers. Um, sometimes people, you know, providers prescribe mesoprostol um, for insertion of an IUD um, and because it softens the cervix, it can make it easier. And so there are cases where people were, um, you know, in states where um, abortion has been banned, people who are trying to get um, their mesoprostol prescriptions filled were unable to because, um, because even though the provider confirmed that it was not for an abortion, the pharmacist decided they weren't gonna fill it just because it could, it, you know, they might be using it for abortion, even though the provider said that's not what the reason was was for the prescription. Um, there's also, you know, just, there's a lot of medications, or I don't know a lot, there are medications that can cause miscarriage. Um, so there are, you know, there are things that people, you know, uh, who are taking, taking um, treatments, for example, for rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or whatnot, you know, the regular medications could cause them to have a miscarriage if they um, if they were to become pregnant, which is a known risk of using these drugs. And often there is, has to be a plan around birth control involved. Um, but, the, but in the wake of Roe v. Wade being overturned, many people lost access to their drugs because, um, you know, the pharmacist or the healthcare provider was refusing to either prescribe it or fill it because it could be considered potentially abortifacient. So it was a very strict, you know, interpretation of what it meant to have Roe v. Wade overturned that was really impacting people's lives and their health. And then finally, there's also the potential, you know, fears of the uh, effects on in vitro fertilization. Um, there's fears that abortion bans could restrict IVF. Um, you know, again, this is not in the actual state bans, but these are spillover effects because, um, you know, 
IVF involves embryos that are, you know, created outside the womb, they're fertilized. And so um, there were some concerns about, you know, what, what it means for access to these embryos and to IVF overall. So there's, there's, there's a lot beyond sort of, you know, induced abortion that is being affected and can continue to be affected. And I want you to remember this. Um, also, a couple of weeks ago, um, Lindsey Graham from South Carolina introduced a bill into the House of Representatives to ban abortions nationwide after 15 weeks. This is um, not gaining any traction because the House, um, the House of Representatives is, um, is very strongly democratic. And I think, um, you know, you know, I, it, it seems like there wasn't even much traction on the Republican side, but I think it's interesting that the, you know, the ruling from the Supreme Court returns the decision around abortion access to the states. Yet there is already a proposal to actually ban abortion at the national level, even though it's been decided that this is an issue for the states to decide. So, um, before we start talking about pregnancy criminalization, I want to talk a little bit about reproductive justice. And so there, um, there are actually a couple sort of unique <laughs> social movements that are involved in reproductive freedom. And the first one is reproductive rights. This is the traditional pro-choice movement. Um, you know, it's not your body. It's, you know, it's not your choice, right? This is very typical language. This um, is a traditional sort of considered the mainstream feminist, um, very white led movement that, um, you know, sort of led to Roe v. Wade and came out of it, but it's very focused on individuals. It's very focused on um, really, you know, like that right to privacy, but it's very also focused on abortion and maybe it's focused on birth control. But I, you know, remember when I first started doing this work, you would never hear anyone talking about um, equity and birthing or parenting in these spaces, but they were just all about sort of preventing and ending pregnancy. And, um, you know, so this, for, for many women of color, this really was not an adequate perspective. It was very narrow. And so um, in the nineties, uh, you know, eight black women um, founded the reproductive justice movement because they, you know, because they were, they felt that the the mainstream reproductive rights movement did not um, did not represent the experiences or the priorities of their communities, which you know, which extended beyond a narrow perspective on abortion access. And certainly, abortion access is an important part of reproductive justice. But like you see with the Hyde Amendment, um, you know, it is that was in. I, I forgot to say. Um, Joe Biden in 2021, it was the first time that the Hyde Amendment was not included in the budget, in the federal budget since, you know, it was first brought on in 1976. And so that is an issue around abortion, but it's really, an, you know, that is considered an important issue of reproductive justice because of who that was affecting. And really for so long, the reproductive rights movement didn't care about it. So reproductive justice really is merging reproductive rights with social justice and human rights to have a more holistic perspective. And so I wanna share this definition of reproductive justice from um, Loretta Ross, who was one of those founders of the movement and Ricky Sollinger, who's a longtime historian in uh, reproductive justice. The definition of reproductive justice goes beyond the pro-choice, pro-life debate and has three primary principles the right not to have a child, the right to have a child, and the right to parent children in safe and health environments. In addition, reproductive justice demands sexual autonomy and gender freedom for every individual. And so while the reproductive rights movement was focused really on that first, the right not to have a child, reproductive justice really saw all three of these things going together, all three of these things as necessary condi conditions for reproductive freedom. I love these um, pieces from the Repeal Hyde Art Project, which, you know, which really get to the heart of what reproductive justice is about. And I'm just going to read a few of them um, to sort of, you know, illustrate this, what this more holistic perspective sounds like. So the first one says, you, you deserve to be in a safe and loving relationship. Freedom from interpersonal and domestic violence is reproductive justice. 
You deserve to choose not to parent, regardless of the circumstances of your pregnancy and how much money you make. Affordable abortion access is reproductive justice. You deserve to take time off to care for a sick child without risking your employment security. Paid family leave is reproductive justice. Um, and I, you know, just to, to highlight this, this, the one about abortion access is, you know, affordable abortion access is reproductive justice. And so now, even though um, the, you know, uh, many Southern states have banned abortion, if you have resources, um, financial resources, time, et cetera, you know, you will be able to travel to another state to obtain an abortion, which was the case um, also, you know, before Roe v. Wade, right? You could, you could travel somewhere. Um, to obtain an abortion. And the fact is that um, reproductive justice highlights the fact that, that even if there is a legal right that exists, these inequities in our society will prevent many from exercising that right and having full self-determination over their reproduction and their bodies. And this is, um, I wanted to share this quote from Oriaku Najoko, who is the new executive director of the National Network of Abortion Fan Funds, which is really taking a reproductive justice perspective. And they say, Roe was the floor. And when the floor is rooted in hetero patriarchy and white supremacy, you have to tear the whole damn house down and build again on land fortified by the reproductive justice framework. And so as devastating as it was for Roe v. Wade to be overturned, and we can see you know, the devastating effects already, I think that many had known for a long time that it was a very weak foundation for reproductive freedom in the United States. And so there is a lot of energy and excitement about rebuilding, um, rebuilding this foundation with some better materials. Um, importantly, you know, abortion access is a racial justice issue. And so this is linked in my um, document that hopefully I, maybe I can share it in the Q and A. Um, this is a really great article that talks about why abortion access is racial justice going, you know, tracing back US history to enslavement and the forced reproduction of black women um, to, link, to linking it to uh, maternal mortality and, um, and lack of access to prenatal care and uh, maternity care in rural areas. And so I definitely recommend this to get a broad overview one thing I wanna highlight is that, um, is this map. And this was from a study that finds higher maternal mortality rates in states with more abortion restrictions. And you can see that, you know, it's, I mean, it, you, I wish I had put that other map up next to this. This is older data, but you can see that those same states where, um, you know, abortion is now totally banned also have the, the highest rates of maternal mortality and particularly we know in the US that maternal mortality disproportionately affects black women. Um, and so it's really, you know, it's really sort of creating a vice in terms of people not being able to control their reproduction and then not being have not having um, the resources to actually have a healthy pregnancy. And that's both healthcare, but also these are also states that have very weak social safety nets in terms of, you know, resources that are financial resources that are dedicated to social services um, for people who are in need. And so, you know, so th this is something that reproductive justice really highlights when it thinks about abortion access. So I wanna move on and um, talk a little bit about pregnancy criminalization, which is something that is now, unfortunately at front of mind with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So you might've heard this phrase, we won't go back. Um, it's been in, you know, the news a lot. It's, you know, it's on signs when you go to protests. And then that left image, you see a coat hanger. And so before Roe versus Wade, um, it was not uncommon, you know, that the idea of a back alley abortion, um, if you've ever seen the movie Dirty Dancing, you, you will know, um, you might know what I'm talking about, but, you know, the idea, the coat hanger imagery came from the fact that people would use coat hangers on themselves to um, induce abortions. And so <clears throat> this idea of like, we won't go back is talking about that time, which um, is horrific because many, many women died um, because of unsafe abortions. But I, I titled my talk, we won't go, we're not going back, we're going somewhere worse because I think the landscape has changed a lot because we have access to medication abortion now. And so 
those very unsafe methods should, you know, are hopefully not going to be people's first line um, option in in cases where they're not able to access clinical care. But there is also, you know, a different landscape around punishment that existed than in, that existed in the 70s. And so pregnancy criminalization is state intervention, and that could happen via law enforcement or child protective services in a pregnant individual's life that aims to restrict their reproductive autonomy and or freedom specifically because they're pregnant. And so there have been cases of people who are um, criminalized for pregnancy because of substance use. And they could be using a substance, for example, you know, like if they are consuming alcohol while pregnant, they may uh, be reported to Child Protective Services or law enforcement. And so consuming alcohol is not, is not illegal, but in this case, it's involving law enforcement specifically because someone is pregnant. And so that's what, it, what that talk, the talk about the pregnancy status comes into play. So um, National Advocates for Pregnant Women has documented more than 1,700 instances since 1973 in which women have been arrested, prosecuted, convicted, detained or forced to undergo medical interventions because of their pregnancy status or outcomes. And so, you know, like the example I gave around substance use, but sometimes there are cases where um, people have been forced to have C-sections against their will, um, or they have been prosecuted for having at-home births, um, you know, in declining, uh, you know, hospital-based care. Um, people have been just, you know, prosecuted for miscarriages um, under laws around fetal personhood, which basically says you, you know, they're, they're about the harming a fetus, but, um, but they don't have sufficient protections for pregnant people. And so there have been 1,700 cases essentially since, um, since the Roe v. Wade case. So um, I mentioned this earlier, self-managed medication abortion, but this is really, you know, when people are self-sourcing the medications for abortion and, you know, taking them without the supervision um, of, a, of a clinician, a healthcare provider. People do this for a host of reasons. It can be an empowering option that promotes dignity and self-determination. Um, you know, many people have had many negative experiences in healthcare environments, and so, to be able to have the agency to do something like this outside of the healthcare environment and community is something that's really can be appealing to folks. Um, you know, it also can, you know, it may be more of a necessity now with restrictions on abortion access. And so it may be the difference from someone um, having to travel multiple states, figure out childcare for their children, figure out coverage for their gas, hotel, and to bring someone along with them to be their sort of person, you know, who drives them back to the hotel after the abortion, you know, it, the, the restrictions and bans uh, make abortion less accessible and more expensive. And so self-managing an abortion may, um, may be the, the most accessible option for some people in, in our current context. But, um, but then there is a great risk um, and an increasing risk of criminalization. And so from 2000 to 2020, If When How, which is a uh, lawyering for reproductive justice, they identified 61 cases of people criminally investigated or arrested for allegedly ending their own pregnancy or helping someone else do so. And so I will say that number is you know, 61 to, since 2000 is a lot smaller than 1700 since 1973. But I think that because abortion has been legal and, you know, until now, um, that is, you know, that is one reason that number is lower and also that medication abortion is relatively new. Um, but I think this is something that people are anticipating is going to become a very big issue now in a post row America. You'll notice that despite um, California's, you know, in general, California's great state for reproductive freedom, but there was a case um, in the Central Valley um, in Hanford, I believe, where there was someone who was jailed um, for their miscarriage. And so, so you know, this is this even though we um, we are a great state, we still face some of these issues. Um, so, in terms of the legal landscape, um, so there are some states that 
explicitly ban self-administered abortion care. So they're explicitly saying you cannot self-manage an abortion. But then there are also 40 other types of laws that have been used to um, criminalize people around pregnancy and self-managed abortion. And so those are laws that criminalize harm to fetuses and they don't have adequate exemptions for the pregnant person. Sometimes these laws have actually come from of domestic violence. And so if someone, um, <coughs> a pregnant person is experiencing domestic violence and they experience a pregnancy loss, then the abuser could be responsible for that. But then it's you know been flipped and used against the pregnant person actually um, in these cases. Um, substance use during pregnancy. So I, you know, I mentioned alcohol consumption, but, but you know, with, with legalization of marijuana, that's a concern. And then of course other substances as well. Um, abortion under certain circumstances. And so a state may not have an explicit ban on self-administered abortion care, but they have a lot of other restrictions um, and they use those to prosecute people for self-managing abortion. Um, and then there are laws that actually criminalize people who assist pregnant people, providers, friends, family, et cetera. So <clears throat> to demonstrate like the sort of how this can happen, um, if when how has this um, resource make an abortion a crime again. And so they have this sort of journey map of a pregnant person and the people that may help them. And I'm gonna just go through this as a way to sort of demonstrate all the different ways that people um, can be criminalized. So, um, and I wanna apologize that um, the resolution was not the greatest on their image and their report. And so that has now translated to my slides. Um, but on the left, we see the pregnant person's journey and then the right, we have the sort of people who help along the way. And so I'm just going to go through this, um, you know, to demonstrate how many different ways people might be criminalized. So um, starting at number one, so someone becomes pregnant and they decide they want to end their pregnancy outside the formal health system. They want to have a self-managed abortion because, for example, they can't afford the clinic-based care. They can't take the time off work. Um, they're on undocumented immigrant and they can't pass through an unavoidable checkpoint. Um, they or their community or their family has experienced harm at the hands of the medical system. Um, or they feel self-directed care is safe and empowering. There's a whole bunch of reasons people might want to self-manage an abortion. So say they call an abortion hotline and the volunteer advises the person about safe and effective ways to end a pregnancy outside of the formal health system. This advocate could face a variety of different charges, including the unauthorized uh, practice of medicine. Continuing on the journey, the pregnant person buys abortion pills. They, you could buy them online. Um, you might be able to buy them over the counter in another country, or you can maybe get them from a friend. So then the pregnant person could face a variety of different drug charges for importing or possessing abortion pills. Um, so say a doula, a doula is a non-clinical support person. We often hear about them in the, in the context of birth, um, but also, there are also abortion doulas who support people um, through, the, you know, through the process. So a doula stays with the person during the abortion, guiding them on how to safely take abortion pills, setting a timer on when to take the pills and helping to make the person feel comfortable, supported and safe. So in some states, the doula could face charges ranging from the unauthorized practice of medicine to the violation of various abortion laws. Um, continuing on the journey, the person ingests the abortion pills in the US and they successfully terminate their pregnancy. Just on that, this, the pregnant person could face charges including feticide, attempted feticide, self-abortion, or attempted self-abortion. Um, say that a friend babysits the person's other children while they're taking the abortion pills. The friend could face a variety of different charges, including accomplice liability. Um, so then the pregnant person, or formerly pregnant person, disposes of the products of conception, so they could face some more different charges, including crimes for abuses against a corpse, disposing of fetal remains or child neglect. And then again, a community health worker helps them dispose of the products of conception, and then they would be subject to potentially the same crimes um, that the pregnant person would be. Further in the journey, the pregnant, the person seeks medical help. Um, you know, they're 
as I said, there is a very low rate of complications related to abortion. There is a higher rate uh, related to medication abortion, or people may seek care for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and they disclose to um, the healthcare provider that they have taken these pills. Um, and so it's very important. F1 House says, you know, people should seek abortion care. I mean, should search, should seek medical care if they're worried about their health. Um, but most of the arrests that have happened related to self-managed abortion were because someone did seek care and then medical providers uh, reported them. So again, the people who help along the way. A health professional learns the person self-induced by taking pills at home and that the abortion was successful. So in some states, the health professional could be turned into a de facto law enforcement official. Um, they could face charges, charges for tampering with evidence, for obstruction of justice, or failing to report the abortion. And this is, um, you know, just as health professional, because this could be a lot of people. And so I think we might think of physicians, doctors, as, as these professionals, but it could be nurses, midwives, um, nurse practitioners, et cetera. I train social workers, and I actually think that social workers could become implicated in this in states where abortion um, is now not is now legal. So health professionals encompass a lot of folks. And then finally, um, the person who, you know, who took the pills, they offer a family member the extra abortion pills left over and they provide them tips on taking it. So then this person becomes the helper. <laughs> They're, they could face a variety of drug charges and be charged with engaging in the unauthorized practice of medicine. While the family member who accepts the leftover abortion pills to end their own pregnancy sort of start this journey of the pregnant person and face all those risks, including the charges for drug related crimes, including solicitation. So, you know, to recap, the, there's, there are lots of different ways that people can be criminalized, and it's not only the pregnant person who could be criminalized, it could be anyone who's perceived as helping along the way or perceived as violating laws. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's really come up a lot is a sort of <laughs> about the surveillance state and uh, the way technology surveils us, um, but, you know, there, if you go on Twitter, there's Right after the decision, every there were a lot of tweets about not um, not you know tracking your period on um, Apple Health or whatever app because it's not secure and that that information could actually potentially be used as evidence against someone to be prosecuted. Um, so Consumer Reports actually you know went through some apps to look at you know privacy policies, et cetera, and, and the extent to which they protected people. But I think this is a thing about like. We're not going back, we're going somewhere worse. We live in a very different society in terms of technology um, and that that actually then can be used against people. Um, and this is something that happened fairly recently that uh, Facebook turned over messages to law enforcement um, that they're a teenager's private chats about her abortion. Um, and then they use those chats to seize her phone and her computer. Um, and are you know using this information to prosecute. Um, and this actually, the actual um, abortion happened prior to Roe v. Wade being overturned. And so this is not a new issue, but it's gonna become a bigger issue because of the extent of restrictions on abortion. And like I said, um, there are a lot of different things that are sort of getting caught up in, in the overturning of access to abortion and those things also get caught up in criminalization, um, especially miscarriage and stillbirth. Um, really, if someone takes um, medication abortion pills and they, you know, this is what this is what the ad, the legal advocates say, you know, and they seek health care, um, there is no way for a healthcare provider to determine that you took these medications. It looks exactly like a miscarriage. Um, and so they advise to not, you know, say, to not say that you took the medications that you're, you know, essentially experiencing a miscarriage if you're seeking care. But what that means is that people who are who are experiencing miscarriages then get caught up in this web of criminalization and then distrust of pregnant people, et cetera. Um, and so we already saw that people are being punished for miscarriage. Um, that's been happening long before Roe v. Wade was overturned, but that that actually may intensify as a result of, of this decision. So what can we do? I 
have probably really depressed you <laughs> with this with this uh, bright and shiny top. But I wanted to start with this quote and thinking about what do we do? Um, this quote, this idea, hope as a discipline. And so I read this, I actually read about this after the Uvalde sh um, shooting in, um, in Texas last spring, but then I came back to it um, when the decision came out. And so this is something um, abolitionist organizer Miami Kaba is very famous for, but they also, they talk about how they heard this at a conference and how it has been um, particularly meaningful to them. And so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read something that they they said in an interview it's a little bit long but i think it's really important and that became a mantra for me in terms of what i would feel of when i would feel unmoored or when i would feel over, overwhelmed by what was going on in the world i would just say to myself hope is a discipline it's less about how you feel and more about the practice of making a decision every day that you're going to that you're still going to put one foot in front of the other that you're still going to get up in the morning and you're still going to struggle. That was what I took away from it. It's work to be hopeful. It's not like a fuzzy feeling, like you have to actually put in energy, time, and you have to be clear-eyed and you have to hold fast to having a vision. It's a hard thing to maintain, but it matters to have it, to believe that it's possible, to change the world. You know that we don't live in a predetermined, predestined world where like nothing we do has an impact. No, no, that's not true. Change is, in fact, constant, right? Octavia Butler teaches us. We're constantly changing. We're constantly transforming. Transforming. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily good or bad. It just is. That's always the case. And so just because that's true, we have an opportunity at every moment to push in a direction that we think is actually a direction towards more justice. And so I think for me, this is really helpful um, to think about when I get overwhelmed, I really also very much, um, you know, continue to be inspired and motivated by reproductive justice leaders um, to really think about actively <laughs> hoping as a discipline and also thinking about this as a long fight, a long game and thinking about how to sustain myself in, um, in really working to build, to build a better world. So some hopeful things are just yesterday, Governor Newsom signed abortion protections into the law. And this is a whole package of um, laws that advocates um, worked to develop in the wake of the Dobbs decision. And um, you know, it includes things like funding for people from coming who are coming out of state to have abortions in the US, in California. Um, and so this is really um transformational. And I think almost everything that advocates wanted was signed into law, except one thing that he decided cost too much money at the, at the, at the very end. Um, but, but this is great news. Um, among the laws that were signed in this package is um, something that my assembly person, Buffy Wicks, um, had led, which is a law that ensures that no one in California will be investigated, prosecuted, or incarcerated for ending a pregnancy or experienced in a pregnancy loss. And so California should no longer be read in the future on that map of people being prosecuted um, for self-managed abortion or really for even for experiencing pregnancy loss because we have this, this law in place. Um, I wanna highlight that California actually has a constitutional amendment protecting abortion rights on the ballot in November. So, um, vote please you should vote we should all vote um because i i went to um i think it was the day the day after the decision was released i went to um a, a rally in downtown oakland and um it was you know it was organized by folks uh, or someone who got up one of the organizers got up and said forget about voting you know it doesn't matter we need to burn the whole place down which i which I understand that sentiment, but I also think that um, it's a both and. I think that we need to vote to, to ensure that things don't get worse, far worse, far more quickly. Um, and so by that, in that vein, I think that not only do each of us need to vote, but I think in California, we can, um, you know, be active in outreaching to other states as, as, as it's helpful. Um, you know, you can text bank, you can send postcards, but really, um, Voting is more important than ever at this moment, especially with the midterm elections coming up in November. Um, and I 
this is a hopeful thing. Um, there was, a, you know, an amendment to the Kansas Constitution um, that would have made abortion illegal, and it was firmly rejected. And I think it it was rejected at a level that was surprising um, to those who were tracking it. And I think that a lot of voters showed up really just to vote on this. Um, I was reading an article this morning that said that Democrats are not going to be helped much. Um, by you know by restrictions to abortion in the in the midterm elections, but I do think that this was a hopeful result, and hopefully um, that drives home the importance of voting and us doing our part um, to to support people in voting in other states. Um, there's a couple of organizations I would encourage folks to look into. Um, one is called United for Reproductive and Gender Equity. Urge. Um, they have ways to get involved on their website. And I'm not sure they have chapters on community college campuses. There's one at Berkeley, but it's maybe something worth looking into um, if this is something people at your institution are passionate about. There's advocates for youth. Um, they have all these campaigns that people can sign up to get involved in. And I know the Condom Collective is something they're always looking for folks to be uh, involved in. And then, um, all Options is another really wonderful organization that sort of centers the spectrum of reproductive experiences from pregnancy, parenting, abortion to adoption. And so they have a, um, a talk line, um, which is a, you know, a number that people can call for support around any of those experiences. And so they have a 30 hour training you have to go through. But if that's something you really are involved, interested in um, doing, being involved in and sort of supporting people um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, that's maybe something to look into. All right, um, so I am done with the formal part of my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I will stop sharing my screen right now. Thank you, Dr. Gomez. We are so glad we are recording this because it's packed with information and I'm hoping that a lot of us instructors can share this with our students and assign it in classes. So again, lots of information to unpack. We'll get started with a question from Catherine Wilson. <clears throat> and Catherine says, self-managed abortions, abortion pills, are not safe for women since women do not see a physician in person which allows for an ultrasound to examine for health concerns such as ectopic pregnancy, determination of how far along the pregnancy is, and also prevents screening for intimate partner violence. Do you feel that these concerns for the health of the pregnant women are more important than the convenience of self-managed abortions? This is an interesting question. Um, and I think there's a lot in it. So I'm gonna, I'm looking at it on my screen so I can try to address all of it. Um, so I think first I would, challenge the assumption that self-managed abortions are not safe. Um, actually, that there is a lot of research, emerging research that shows that they are as safe as um, those involving clinicians. And so that information is sort of new and fairly new and being gathered. Um, but I think I would just, you know, sort of say that like, in general, I don't think we should say they're not safe. Um, I think, um, you know, there has been research that shows that people are able to, um, you know, effectively estimate how how far along they are in the pregnancy, et cetera. Um, so that also contributes to the safety. Um, I think also it's in other places, um, people the medication medication abortion regimen is available beyond ten weeks, and so I think it is more restricted in the U.S. That but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not safe after, you know, what, what the cutoff is. And so I think that's also something to consider. Um, I think that interactions, um, things like, you know, healthcare providers screening for intimate partner violence is so important. And I think that is really, uh, you know, an important role that the healthcare system needs to be more involved in. Um, but that's not just the responsibility of an abortion provider. That's the responsibility of all healthcare providers, regardless of someone who is pregnant or not. And so 
I don't, I guess I don't see those things in opposition. I think that's important, but I think also not all healthcare providers do those screenings. Not all healthcare providers treat people with dignity and respect. And so there is also harm that comes from requiring involvement. And frankly, some people just will not go, right, if they have to be subjected to that harm. So I think, um, I'm not sure if I answered a yes, no to your question, but I hope I provided some context to, to, to deepen our thinking, so. Mm -hmm. And then Kathleen is saying, is abor uh, abortion illegal in California? I know you mentioned voting, but I was unsure if it was legal oh. or illegal. Yeah, yes, it is legal. It is legal and California is one of the states that has the most protections around abortion. Um, and so that, that legislation that Governor Newsom just signed yesterday strengthens those protections. And so abortion is legal. It's not a, in our constitution. And so what is on the ballot for November is making it a constitutional right, which furthers the protection because the people have voted to, to have the constitutional right in addition to all these policies that are in place in the state. So I will say that abortion access is not, un, is not even in the state. Um, if you live, in the Central Valley, um, you may have to go to LA or come to the Bay Area um, to, to get care because there are not that many providers or there are a lot of restrictions on the type of care that they'll provide. And so even though we have a lot of resources here, they, they are sometimes unevenly distributed across our big state. I have noticed uh, that folks here, we do get complacent. Uh, including my mm -hmm. my own 16 year old who's like well we're in California we have yeah. nothing to worry about um and so it's really important to keep up to date and again emphasize how voting uh functions in all of this yeah um so I had a couple of questions of my own and we'll keep monitoring the chat as well um, one of the things that I was thinking about is I'm really grateful that you introduced us to the reproductive justice framework because that's so much broader and we do have a dark history where Margaret Sang Sanger had allied with eugenicists and so on yes. while she was advocating for women's access to birth control. Yep. Uh, there was a lot of this other messed up stuff that was happening. Um, and so, as you're saying, reproduct reproductive justice is talking about living wage, police violence, universal health care, prison abolition. And I'm wondering if there's a possibility to build solidarity in our movements here, uh, or is it overwhelming? Have you noticed that with folks you work with on the ground when we talk about all these different issues? Mm -hmm. And how do we go about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there are um, there are some amazing reproductive justice organizations, and when you go to their websites and see the work that they're doing, they are um, often addressing, you know, a lot of a lot of different issues. I mean, I think it, you know, it's it really depends on the organization. Um, I know, for example, California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. They're based in LA. Um, they will, you know. They do things on universal healthcare insurance, or they will do things on um, reparations for for um, survivors of forced sterilization. They'll do things around young parents, and so they they do do a lot of things. And I think they do the organizations who are in reproductive justice are are constantly working in coalition. And I do think um, that other movements are maybe you know I think in the, historically. Um, Sometimes people don't want to partner with, I'm not going to say with reproductive justice organizations, but they don't want to partner around abortion because it is a, such a hot button uh, stigmatized issue. They don't want to be attached to it. And I think that given um, the state of things, it seems like there are other people from other movements that are more interested now uh, than they would have been before. I think there's a lot of stuff around climate justice. Actually, I think there's a lot of um, collaboration there in sort of, you know, thinking about um, climate justice and reproductive justice together. That's one area where I have seen a lot of work in climate, you know, environmental health is another area where there's been a lot of sort of eugenicist um, history in terms of trying to 
restrict um, the fertility of black and brown people in order to better the earth when in fact the polluters are the big corporations um, based in the US and you know other other wealthy places right mm -hmm. um, so you know so I think there is I think that it can be overwhelming because reproductive justice is really about having you know an equitable <laughs> and fair world right um, and so I think that um, that I think there there has to be a lot of thought and in, gone into what what issues people take up. So, mm -hmm. and then our professor Lin Huang is asking, what mm -hmm. strategy do you find most effective for helping uninformed anti-choice people understand the importance of reproductive rights and reproductive <laughs> justice? And I'll just quickly add on to that as a professor myself as well. That abortion seems to have so much stigma associated with it. Yeah. It's a very emotional issue. And um, I'm not saying it's emotional for everyone, but that's certainly how it's framed, right? All the discussions around abortion. Yep. And um, for me as a teacher, I definitely want to have a diversity of thoughts, opinions, discussions in the class and not stigmatize any perspective on abortion. So I think this is a really important question for many of us teachers that how it's so important to get rid of the misinformation, have these discussions, but at the same time, how do we do that skillfully? Well, I feel that I'm probably not the best person <laughs> to this question because I also live here in Berkeley, California, and I teach, you know, at UC Berkeley. And I think, um, you know, some I sometimes feel we're in a bubble, right? In terms of thinking about this. Like I said, I am from Kentucky, um, but I don't necessarily engage with people um who are quote unquote unformed. And I personally just don't have the um emotional bandwidth to do so like on Twitter or social media. Um mm -hmm. but I think one thing that I the first thing that came to me is storytelling. And I think that um, you know. There has been a lot of work. So there, there's an organization called Shout Your Abortion. Um, and there's a lot of been work done around abortion storytelling as a way to um, destigmatize abortion. Um, and so I, I think if I was going into a situation like that, I might start with someone's story or multiple stories because I think um, so much of this discussion is sanitized and isn't centering the humanity of the people who are going through these things. And so I think that that's somewhere I would start because then people, even if, if, if it, you know, that create creates the opportunity to create connections between experiences, whether it be, you know, having to make a decision about something because you can't afford it um, mm -hmm. or being mistreated in a healthcare setting or whatnot. Um, I think that's, you know, that's where I would start. Um, I would love to ask my colleagues who are like working in Ohio or Georgia how they approach this, but um, but I think that's you know something that is a resource. I feel that's just a growing resource in terms of people's stories, um, video, mm -hmm. written, whatnot. Um, that is that's an important place to start, I think. And then, Dr. Gomez, you see uh, you see the comment right from our attendee and I wonder anonymous if attendee. Uh, if you want to respond to that <laughs> comment. Um, yeah, so I think I would just heartily disagree with this person. Um, I There's a lot of junk science that um, supports, you know, negative, that claims that there are negative effects of abortion, but, you know, these articles have really been, um, been broke, you know, been interrogated, and there's a lot of methodological problems with that. So I, I think I would say that I you know, sort of uh, don't believe that that data are accurate. And I would refer people to the um, the report on the safety and quality of abortion care in the US because that is that was done by a comp in a comprehensive way by an independent body reviewing all the literature and it does not find that there are these risks. Um, and so I will say that abortion data, I don't know if I'll say, I would say they're unreliable, but um, abortion is a hard thing, can be a hard thing to study because, you know, there are some data that come from the CDC, like states are required to report um, some things, like they're required to report births and deaths, et cetera. 
And so that's where some of the national data come from. But if you are trying to do research on abortion, and so you're, say you, you're doing a survey um, and you ask people if they've ever had an abortion or, you know, there's so many different ways you can ask people about it. There's an issue called underreporting where um, people often will not they'll under report like based on what we know in terms of what's happening in the you know from the the national data and i think that's largely because of stigma right or maybe fear of punishment or knowing someone's going to find out and so i think um there is an issue of trying of doing research in this, this area because of the stigma um that is around abortion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I have also been thinking a lot about the protests happening in Iran right now. Um, a lot of the news being censored from there, where we know that there are women, men out on the streets um, triggered by the death of the young woman who was in custody by the moral police in Iran. Mm -hmm. And I, it just got me thinking, and as you were describing all the criminalization that's happening here, uh, that we have a tendency in the U.S. to think of, you know, women's rights under attack in Iran, Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. And very often we don't think about the control of women's bodies <laughs> right here. And so I'm, I'm wondering if drawing that parallel is alarmist or do you really see that level of threat um, to democracy and women's freedom here, and also if there is a possibility for a global movement. Um, well, I don't know. I, 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 I think I, I, I won't say I don't see the possibility, but I think that it is um, far away, but maybe not as far away as we would like it, seeing that what, what's happened in the U.S. Um, particularly in the last five or six years and um, around the way our, our democracy has already been threatened so much. Um, so so I, I, I do think that there is the possibility of global global movements for solidarity in ways that there weren't before because, um, you know, these things are much more real and more connected to us and more about um, people directly sharing their stories because they can through social media. Whereas 20 years, I don't know, 20 years, when I was a kid, you know, we would just see what we see on the news and whatever journalists, you know, chose to highlight. And so I think that that creates a lot of possibilities, but then there's also the harms to democracy that come from social media because of, you know, messages that are being received manipulation by other governments or parties or et cetera. So, um, so I think, I'm not sure if I answered your big question, but I think there's a lot to yeah. consider. No, and yeah. it's unfair to expect <laughs> like a clear <laughs> cut, but it's just, I was sharing aloud, like what I've been thinking about in terms of what's happening around the globe. Uh, and then we now have just time for, thank you for being generous with your time, but uh, just this last one from Catherine Wilson. And I'm wondering if you can uh, respond to that before we close out. Um, I would just refer you to the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics uh, statement because um, that is the, the authoritative body, I would say, for pediatricians. Um, I will put it in the, in the link. Yeah. Um, and I think that I, I, I'm not actually familiar with that organization. So I do know that there are medical organizations who, um, who, who do not agree with the the overall conclusions of the medical literature and establishment around abortion. And so I, I would refer you to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, Rosa, do you have anything else you would like to mention? Um, no questions, but just a big thank you um, to Dr. Gomez for joining us today and for, for making the commitment to make sure the event happened um, after our rescheduling. Um, and thank you, Dr. Niyogi, also for facilitating the Q&A. Um, and I think just to close things out, um, I did want to pick back up on one of your um, quotes in the presentation that hope is a discipline. And I think that message really carries uh, from our theme last semester also around cultivating critical hope. And that maybe that's part of the message that we carry forward 
in building healthy communities, right, for, for everyone and looking at so many issues that are affect, affect our communities, especially uh, women, women of color, uh, folks living in poverty. So I really appreciated that, that message in this, that it does feel overwhelming at times, but we have to keep at it. And these conversations, which often are complicated and hard, um, are also important for us to have so we continue to learn as a community and to advocate. So I want to thank you for that. And um, in closing, um, like we mentioned at the beginning, we, we would like to, um, well, I'll, I was gonna talk about the survey, but this is the resources. Thank you, Christina. We want to note the resources that Dr. Gomez shared. You can um, use the QR code or the link here. And Christina also noted the resources in the Q&A, if you wanna click on the, the Google Doc. So those are there for, for those of you that need it. And we would love your feedback so we can continue to improve our series and to make sure we're, we're connecting with our audience. So you can again use the QR code or the, the link here to give us feedback. It's a very short survey. I think it's like three questions. So please, please take some time to do that before we end. And a reminder that we are recording this event. It will be posted on our website in the next week or so. And if you want to go back to any of our speakers for the last couple of years, they're also on that website. And our upcoming event is on October 12th with Hill Malatino speaking on trans arts of survival. So we hope that you can join. This will also be a webinar event. Um, and I believe Hill Malatino is joining us from Pennsylvania. So uh, we have guests from all over. Anything else to wrap up? Sangar, Christina. Uh, that's it for me. And then always thank you. Thank you to Christina Gomez for always handling the tech so seamlessly. And thank you to our marketing team for creating our beautiful visuals and flyers and all our peeps at the Student Equity Work Group who just are a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun putting together these speaker series. So thank you all. Thank you. Until the next one. Shri Krishna Chandra Ne Mathura